The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So, my team name was the name of our office team, which is pretty much self explanatory. Um, in the beginning, we, were fun, we had a very, very fundamental knowledge of optics and microwaves. Um, my team was Arthur Dollar, Chris Mandy, and myself, Ethan Booby. The main motivation for our project was to help out the mid set in the power game competition. Um, its primary focus was power beaming, uh, transmitting power to the fiber up on the river. And we chose, the microwave was chosen because it's more, supposedly more efficient and more scalable than solar and other options that we that we visited. And so our system needed to supply adequate power, amount of power to the right antenna panel at, at a distance and need to be easily disassembled and assembled around the river by computer. Uh, they also need to be highly efficient and cost effective. We divided our design into three subsystems. The dish, which uh, we utilized a pre-made satellite dish, just because of the simplicity and cost effectiveness. The dish needed to call in the light, or microwave energy, sorry. And it also needed to be fast and easy to assemble around the rhythm and needed to, be, to stay stable as well as level during the competition. The second component of our system was uh, microwave horn support, which was designed to hold the microwave and horn, horn system on the top of the dish and deliver the microwave energy to the dish. We had to have an adjustable height so that it could allow us to focus the energy and we needed to reach enough to support the horn without any flex so that it was precisely efficient. And finally, the microwave circuit was probably the most important component of our system. It uh, supplied the microwave energy for the climber, had to circularly polarize energy and transfer it to the climber. It also needed to be as efficient as possible. This is our preliminary sketches. <laughs> uh, first one, we were just uh, going through the concepts. I uh, noticed the uh, theme. As well as this was our asymmetric drawing sketch with the horn stand, dish, and then the hybrid systems down here. So, um, just I'm writing these down here so you have an idea of what requirements we set down so I can show you which one of you actually achieved. So, the first thing I have to say is that we were very optimistic at the beginning. And we wrote two levels of requirements, one level which was absolutely necessary for the thing to work, and a second level which would have been nice had it been there. As you will see later on, we didn't even get to try to solve any of the second level requirements. So requirements were functional. Um, we had a certain amount of energy which had to be transferred to the rectana. We had this energy had to be transferred for a certain period of time, which is 50 seconds, and the rectana itself was at a varying height of 10 to 60 meters. And then should we, well, if we were to add any component to the climber itself, these components would have had the weight limitation simply because of the contest itself. Um, the constraints we had, these were rather important. The first thing is that the Rectana team required a circularly polarized light. So this is our biggest constraint actually on our system, and the rest is rather logical. And then we had an interface constraint, which is simply that our beaming stuff has to go around uh, the base of the ribbon, which the climber has to climb, and uh, the um, uh, power source, which whoever's organizing the competition provides us is limited as well. So when we were looking at this here, sorry, we're going to start talking about design. This part is the microwave circuitry itself. And we knew nothing about microwaves when we started. And this meant that unfortunately there were a very, very large amount of options for absolutely everything. So beaming the microwaves could have been done by generating microwaves from helical antennas. This had a very big advantage that the microwave was immediately a circular polarized, or we could start with magnet shots, which is what we chose for uh, reasons of having a magnetron and not knowing anything about helical antenna. Not for any other reason than that. The um, transmission of the microwaves itself can go through various things, wax, 
uh, tables or wavelengths. Polarization can be generated through a very large amount of uh, possibilities. We have beam wiping itself because we're starting with a magnetron beam, which is this wide. It's a little over two inches, well, a little less than two inches wide. And we have to generate a beam, which is nearly three meters wide. Um, so, well, getting reflections all around because we're transferring the beam can be also done through a very, very large amount of waves. Uh, so, for instance, offset reflection simply offset. The Pascal reflection was the initial idea which you saw in the drawing. Uh, the conical reflection is a little more complicated but it involves slits, and the advantage of slits is you get diffraction, so you can widen the beam as well. Then we have the beam collimation, uh, which is how to target it towards the rectana and find boundary mitigation. This is a very big issue apparently in microwaves. We don't fully understand it, but uh, you need to make sure that the. So, what happens is if Apparently, if the light propagates in such a way that there is a discontinuity um, in the medium, you get something called evanescent waves. An evanescent wave pump out a large amount of power. So you want to make sure that apparently whatever you do, Maxwell's equation stays continuous. So this is the final circuit we chose. This is generated using a program called COMSOL. Uh, it took us about a week to find out what program we wanted, and then probably another week to find out how it worked. Comsol is a really nice program. It knows everything about physics. It just doesn't want to tell you. So uh, um, it's rather complicated. We only got to generate a 2D version of the circuit itself, assuming a beam source which is circularly polarized because we just couldn't manage to put in all the intricate circularly polarizing stuff. And what we have here is so you can assume that magnetrons are here. Uh, circularly polarizing stuff is down here. Beam enters into a wave band. We have two H-bands. H-bands are a type of band which bend around the um, a magnetic field. Um, so these are more wave banks here. There's a horn down here, and the horn widens the beam in a rather efficient way, it reflects onto a dish, and then the line goes above. So this means that the horn and then this tubing here actually blocks part of the radiation. Uh, just so that you kind of understand what happens, can you click on the picture? So this is a graph which just shows the electric field as it varies over one uh, period of, so over one wavelength essentially. And you can see that um, because the line is circularly polarized, you get flatness period when there's maybe no electric field anywhere in the circuit. And this disk basically is what caused us many, many problems. And you can see that power is proportional, so the power of the uh, light itself is proportional to the electric field and the magnetic field, which, is, which means that when you have uh, zero moments, you actually have no power at all, so the average is rather bad. And you can also see that the electric field uh, diminishes very, very fast once we exit the wave bands. This is because we're wiping it. So this is again another issue of why we're using power. So is after is that what led to the no, this is what led to the efficiency problem. The efficiency problem is polarization. So magnetrons emit light which is completely, which has no coherence. It's just light in anything. So before we actually transfer it in here, this light has to be rendered coherent, and the signal to noise ratio is rather bad when you start with. And um, that is one issue. And the other issue is the fact that, according to what we read, um, microwave technology is rather an art. And things like dishes here have an efficiency of maximum 55%. The horn has an efficiency of at most 45%. And so all these things add up. And just by, by putting all these all together, we really needed a very large amount of fire machine. So our first calculations. Um, which were just you know, hand calculations back at the end, but so that we would have a, with our system, an efficiency of 14%. Consol told us that in the end we had 8%, which is rather nice. Uh, the plots here show the energy in a watts per meter cube, so this is at every point uh, throughout the system. So as you can see inside the wavetime, it's rather nice. And then the area which interests us is here, because this is where the light is collimated. And the light is collimated at uh, 129 watts per meter cube. This is for a circular rectangle of a meter of radius, this gives 410 watts, which is just about what we needed. Now, just can you go back? Just one thing I wanted to show you is, uh, during our optimization, a number of things, well, one of the really nice things we added in was that at the beginning when I was designing or actually uh, calculating the stuff, there was always these very strange things occurring, which is a characteristic of something called uh, impedance mismatch, mismatch sorry, in microcircuitry. I found, I don't know why it happens, but I found that by adding simply behind the horn any convex plate, this impedance mismatch would completely disappear. 
you can see here on the left side there is a simple convex plate behind the corner, on the right side there isn't one, and the energy is kind of brighter on this side simply because there's more of it, whereas on the right there isn't. So once the impedance is completely matched, you can see that all of the energy inside the waveband is nearly perfect. The center of the waveband has generally the maximum energy, which is what the corners are looking for. Now to show you what pieces look like, this is what a full assembly would, would require. So unfortunately we would need 12 right drop. Uh, so these microphones have to be assembled together using something called a beam combiner. This is what a beam combiner looks like. The beam combiners themselves have to go through a uh, something with a very strange name which and any of the polarization, I'm sorry, I forgot it. So essentially all it does is it has one side which is the quarter of a wavelength, wavelength longer than the other side. And so by putting them together, the line becomes polarized. Uh, and also twisting the uh, field. And then, so once light comes out of this, we're circuit polarized. We just go through waveguides, H bands, waveguide, H band, waveguide, horn, and through the horn to the dish uh, itself. Um, yes, just a quick question. You go back to the previous slide. Um, that long thing up there is yeah. what makes it circularly polarized? It is. Where, what happens to most of the energy? Let off this heat or okay. Most of the energy is actually so this is circular polarization, this is the beam combining. And it's a little bit complicated. I couldn't find a picture of it, but the beam combiners we would use have actually four ports. And one port just lets off the remaining energy the rest. Uh, so really? what you have is incoming light is deep in, it's non-coherent, outcoming light is coherent, and you just lose coherence while you gain coherence that way. So you can filter out the incoherence. Somewhat yes. Okay. So uh, we needed a support to support our horn and the microphone. And the big guys should be going through the stand. And it was a bit challenging to design the stand because it was not at all stable. Because we needed something which is around 40 inch high and which spreads around 63 inches. So it's really unstable because one end it just extends and it breaks the whole system down. So we at first we tried with some hollow cavity aluminum sheets welded together. And it proved to be really unstable. And then we came up with something called the Wiki Wiki technology. So it's just like, I don't know, we were inspired by the cranes. Yeah, we were inspired by this awesome crane. And so in Wiki Wiki, as you can see, we have rods. And then we just take a might be aluminum wire or might be even rods, and we just weld them together in that way. And it increases the stability many fold. With the first light, like, uh, when we tried with just rectangular blocks, it was not only really heavy, but it was really unstable. It just had a huge displacement of more than 4 millimeters. And when we tried it, when we analyzed it on Cosmos using the PGVK technology, as you can see in the next slide, the displacement was around 0 0.003 millimeters, which is fine. Like, even if you have a horn out there, and it's totally fine. Like, you not have any big deflection with that. And um, well, those are some of the positive sides of the stand we have designed. It's very lightweight compared to the solid sheet cavity thing. And it has got greater stability. And it, it can be put together pretty fast because it can be just bolted. We need to bolt only that side. And this will need eight nuts and bolts. And it can be assembled pretty fast. And since it is hollow and like air can pass easily, so we can minimize the air resistance. And also, it's easy to make and cheap. Some of the negative sides are we still couldn't figure out a way to make a y-axis variable so that we can change the cone, which can be the horn, which can be attached to that point, so that we can collimate when desired. Like as we were talking about in the other part, we can change the horn, as, like we can change the position of the focal point, and we can have different collimation. And we can figure out a way to do that. And it's it has got an unstable weight distribution. Because this is 40 inch and this is 63 inch, so if you place it, it's just still unstable. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we had a plan of putting a diagonal bar over there, but then we figured out like we have the dish and then we have the bar. We can't actually put the diagonal bar because you can have to go through the dish. Otherwise, it's not unstable. And if you try something of this sort, it doesn't help much. We have to have something around. I guess it was 40 by 20. So it's this, and but we have the so it's not possible.
Okay, next part was we had to design a stand for the dish. So we want to make it fast and easy to assemble. So what we came up with was to have, since the dish comes in four sections, to have three legs per section so they can each stand on their own. And then to assemble it, you just simply carry each section in with legs already on, set it up, and then bolt it together. It could be done very quickly and very efficiently. And also, it's very easy to assemble. Another view of it. Okay, so we made a very, very, a slide of very, very small numbers so you can't read them for the cost analysis because given the fact that we have to buy 11 magnet trunks, we have one, the total price comes up to 17, well actually nearly $18,000. Uh, a lot of the money comes in, in the microwave side of the magnet trunks are rather expensive and also all of the um, beam combiners, the waveguides, the uh, quite a extra coupler, all of that costs a lot of money. But the only very cheap part is the one because you can just make a lot of nearly everything. Ah, yes. So I promise you to show you what requirements we would theoretically have achieved. We haven't built anything for various reasons. One of them is because NARCA doesn't want to pay the $18,000. Uh, others are because we think there might be better solutions. And essentially out of the requirements we have, the ones we satisfy according to theory are functional requirements and safety regulations. The rest are not that. Laws, physics. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the reason I nearly took them out is because I I don't think that we have modeled everything in console. I just don't think it would work. Yeah. All right, so these are the improvements that can still be done to our system. One of them is polarization, they can activate it. And I'll just do that because I'm this point. <laughs> so the polarization issue is that the main reason why we're not efficient is because we want to polarize light. When we started off, we were trying to see whether we could put a. So the team name is the Naive About Optics team. We initially knew a little more about optics than about radio stuff. So we wanted to see whether we couldn't apply our optics knowledge. And the very, very first thing, first thing we thought of was to try and beam up uh, linearly polarized light, or just unpolarized light, and circularly polarize it at the rectenna by having what is called a Fresnel rom, uh, which is a form of crystal just in front of it. And this would have probably helped a lot in the beaming power. But as it turns out, we nobody does crystals or uh, microwaves, so we don't exactly know why nobody uses optics, everybody uses the radio frequency knowledge and don't have the information at the same. Now, another thing we can change is what, uh, <laughs> what we found out about on Tuesday. We thought about designing an offset reflector dish. We didn't do it because we, we thought that um, we would have to build a new dish, we didn't know how to make a nice, a nice uh, parabolic dish. It would probably help in blockage losses. Um, anyway, the system has to be redesigned, so this is going to be another issue. The third thing is software use. The console is nice. I think there are perhaps like better uh, softwares we could use to improve model what we need. We don't know them yet, but I'm sure we can find them. And um, so the beam source itself, we should actually look at what happens when it use helical antennas, just to know. Because it might be nice. It would be nice. Um, yeah, the rest is what I've already mentioned. So beam direction, we don't see and the animation itself. Small sentence of understand. So we can play more with the VGVG structure to figure out the best angle at which the VGVG can be made so that it is much more stable. And I, I really want to work more on unstable wave distribution as I do 40 by 63 is not good. And improve stability by proper load distribution of the wave guides and everything. So we need more uh, cosmos analysis and finally we'll figure it out. Okay, so we have a recommendation from the set just in case. Um, so the first thing is, of course, we had a lecture on, on Tuesday. We have to change a lot of things since the lecture. Another thing is that we haven't done a thermal analysis, and this could be a very big issue. Uh, to do a thermal analysis, you need a 3D model of anything. We haven't, we don't have a 3D model of console. We're probably going to have to make one hands-on in console. So it would be nice to buy console or, or a similar software. Console itself costs two thousand dollars. It's probably not what you want to invest. Um, and then a few other things. It is very clear in we find in literature that what you design will not be what you get, simply because there are a lot of changes. Apparently, people who make microwave circuitry, once the circuit is made, they take a steel ball, roll it in the circuit, attach it to the magnet, and whenever they see things go well, they drill a hole through the waveguides and add screws. And this is just how it's done, apparently. In the past, it was apparently done by coating uh, cockroaches in silver and having the cockroaches go through the, <laughs> uh, the circuitry. Um, so essentially, we need to have the design reviewed by um, maybe this is a legend, but I think we 
<laughs> we, we need to have the design review by somebody who hasn't followed us at all since the beginning, just so that we have a fresh perspective. And we need to test stuff one at a time, not all up, because it's not going to work how you assembled it. So essentially, what we've learned from all this is that it's very, very nice to trust the specialists, and it's also very necessary to not trust them. Uh, specialists in microwaves disagree about just about everything on the internet, and uh, when you talk to them, so you have to know who to follow, and I don't really know who that is right now. Um, another thing is that ma magnetron specs do not correspond to what is measured. Things like the waveband which comes out of Microsoft is not actually the band that they told us. So we probably should have measured before designing it. Um, so when we were trying various designs in console itself, it turns out that the simplest thing you do is always apparently the thing which works best. Anything we were trying to change, make an offset design for the just never worked as well. And um, yeah, the other two things are that there's quite a lot to know about microwaves. And what actually matters is very limited. We don't know what that is. It's apparently just as an example, in a waveguide you can have, well, there are 12 standard modes of transmission. I think the first one matters. This is something we didn't know until the very late. So the problem is that the first one is rather simple, the second one makes it difficult math, the third one makes it even more complicated math, etc. Which is why you can spend a lot of time doing things in theory which in the end you don't use. And uh, finally, it's quite possible to do crazy things in math, but I think that it would have been really better if we were a lot of us and I'm trying to understand the geometry. The way you described it, it sounded like the, the antenna is supposed to go around the ribbon. Yes, the yes. ribbon. So we're pretty lucky. And, and, but then, I mean, if, if the ribbon runs through the center of it, the horn clearly can't be relaxed. It's not exactly that. So I, I guess I didn't quite get it. Yeah. So the horn is not exactly at the focus, which is why we move it. And so it's just off. Uh, ribbon itself, and the reflections inside the dish cause the beam to actually propagate all around. Uh, I have a really question. I guess this is following up on Tuesday. This uh, notion that you have to have coherence, that you have to have circularly polarized light, certainly true for a radar system, but not for a power beaming system. So but it's necessary for the rectangular to work. That's that's what I'm not. What I is don't it, fully understand. Do you really mean coherence, or do you mean just to be certain that you follow it? Which is not the same. No, it's not. But the coherence is like with a, with a laser. It is. Laser. But what happens is, if you just stick to magnetrons with a uh, quadrature coupler together, you're not going to get cyclic polarized light. Mm -hmm. Because the two magnetrons right. emit stuff which, is, which has very strange signals. So the first thing you want to have is a pure flat linearly polarized signal before you can actually set the program. And this is what you have to get out of the magnetron first. This is where we use energy. But you could have two orthogonal polarizations, yes. two orthogonal linear polarizations that are this not coherent. This is true, but this would change the antenna itself. Not the, so it would certainly help quite a lot with uh, beaming. We would probably increase efficiency by a factor of 10, perhaps, or at least 7, I'd say. Yeah. But the rectangular design itself, as it, as it was when we started, so this was a constraint we had required to be polarized back. So this was an initial constraint, but not something we could play with. But the, but the potentially new one. Yeah, the new one. Yeah, one, the new one that's why I was raising my hand. Absolutely. Yes, would dual polarization help? So, so if you it went out. Not non polarized light. Well, actually, linearly polarized light in two perpendicular directions. Yes. It's yes, exactly what would come. Now, would that, if that were possible, would that drop the number of magnetrons that we need? Yes. So I've, I've started doing, I don't know if I can show them now. Sorry, I'm not using the right user. I've started doing simulations in console. What I have is two, so waveguides, if they're circular, they're nice, which is what we have. They're nice for um, cyclic polarized light. If they're rectangular, they're cheaper, which is a good thing. But they're only good for linear polarized light. Then I want one, no. They're only good for light, which has um, the electric field in one direction. The waveguide itself is rectangular, so the electric field and the magnetic field has to be specifically along the lines, which means that we would have to have two separate systems if we want two directions of uh, polarization. And so what I've done is I've taken two magnetons as we have them now, run them from nearly the same thing, so I just make the dishes a little different, and we have much better, so at the moment I need four magnetons now. But I'm sure we can improve this. Um, this, or, that you said when you have a quadrature coupler, but you don't have coherent uh, linearly polarized, but uh, my going to do it. 
then you don't get circular polarized radiation out. Yes, you, should it just be uh, two orthogonal polarization modes? Nearly, it's just the, I, to be honest, I don't fully understand how pressure couple works. It's not. It's more than just the wave uh, wave issue because you're you're as you saw, quadrature cover is a rectangular thing, and you're coming out of the circular right. uh, beam. So there's a little more to it than that. And what happens when you just put two signals which aren't appropriate for the quadrature cover is you get a signal of not which is um, still decoherent. It's actually a really decoherent decoherent right. signal. But you don't need a dual polarization setup to be coherent. You do, I think. Well, I no, no, you don't need a dual. My understanding was the quadrature coupler just uh, puts the 90 degrees. And gives it the offset, so you want in sync radiation going in, so it'll come out circular. Yeah. But if you just put it in as a big mess that is linear in one direction, should you just get out two that are linear and perpendicular to one another? No. Or, I mean, maybe we both need to read more about it. But yeah, I, I'm not sure it works that easy. Okay. Thomas? So I, I'm also very naive about optics, but I just wondered what you had found out about helical antennas. Because I, I have seen circularly polarized quite generated by helical antennas, but I haven't seen it done using the scheme that you're using. Okay, so, so if, if we have a circularly polarized antenna, then we just remove everything and the dish itself is replaced by a mat of circular, sorry, of helical antennas. And this will beam up directly circularly polarized light. So the question is, can we make it efficient? Okay, thank you.